Josh Berry isn't your typical NASCAR Cup Series rookie. At 33, he has years of experience on fellow first-year drivers Carson Hosovar and Zane Smith. Among that experience includes just shy of three full-time seasons in the Xfinity Series at Junior Motorsports, where he earned five wins. This offseason, the Tennessee native moved up and onward to Stuart Haas Racing, where he's driving the number four car, replacing the future first ballot Hall of Famer, Kevin Harvick. I had a chance to visit with Barry, and we talked about a variety of topics, including how it's impossible to replace Harvick, what it's been like within the walls of Stuart Haas Racing, and if he's heard the criticism, he has, and what exactly happened in the Las Vegas race that upset Brad Keselowski to the point of where he flipped him off. I'd like to welcome to the channel, Josh Berry. Hey, Josh. So let's go back to you getting this gig. Um, I know, I'm sure you've watched the I Am Kevin Harvick documentary, and he talks about in there, coming into that season after Dell died, no one could replace Dell. So now here we are all these years later, and it's you coming in to replace him. So I'm just curious, A, if you saw the documentary and kind of seeing what he said, and if you're kind of having those same feelings of, I can't replace Kevin Harvick. Yeah, I think, um, you know, on the documentary side, obviously I thought it was really cool. And, and, you know, that was such a unique scenario for him to to have to go through that. I don't think any of us will really know exactly how, you know, how to feel or what to, what to do in that scenario. And, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I agree. I think that in, in the grand scheme of things, I'm not, I'm not Kevin Harvick. I'm not trying to be Kevin Harvick, right? Like, um, you know, he's a hall of famer, going to be a hall of famer. Um, and, you know, for me, I think, and as a driver, there's, there's always pressure to perform at this level, um, regardless of the situation. And, and I think, you know, being in this situation is no different than, you know, the situation that I was in last year as a substitute or my time at junior motorsports, you, know, you always want to perform the best you can. And I feel like that's where I'm at with it. Right. I think that uh, the one thing that I have on my side is that Kevin has a has built a very, you know, they built a very strong group, um, you know, with Rodney being the leader and um, the, the majority of that group is still intact from when Kevin raced. And, and that's been a huge benefit to me because they're, they're a really strong group. This is your first year, your first, your rookie. Um, but you, you know, you've heard all the rumblings and criticism of SHR. I'm just curious for someone who's coming in in their first season do you hear it? Do you block out the noise? Do you talk to your teammates because they've been here and they've heard it? What, what kind of what is the mindset around SHR and yourself specifically when it comes to the criticism and the noise from outside? Well, I think for one, obviously, it, it, it's motivating for all of us, and and everybody here is is working working extremely hard to to get back to you know to contending for wins and winning races and and, and all that, right? Like that's all been been said. Uh, over and over. And I think that everybody, you know, what my experience has been is, is, is from being on the grounds here and working here and being a part of this program for now, you know, let, you know, let's say six months or so is that it's a lot better here than a lot of other places around. And I, and I don't, I don't think that the rap that, that Stuart Haas racing is get is getting is necessarily fair, right? Like they've had a, you know, a, you know, they have a, had a tough year, but even from, um, you know, the, even with Kevin's season last year, Kevin was in the contention to win a lot of races, um, including his last one. And I just don't think the negative, um, you know, I, I just don't necessarily feel like it's all fair. I think in, in this day and age, people just want, you just want to pile on somebody that's down and enjoy doing that. Um, you take Noah, for example, right? I mean, Noah's a great example. Um, you know, obviously him coming in and being a teammate, right? Like, six months ago, everybody wanted Noah gone and we're running through the mud every chance they got. And now he runs six this weekend, has a great weekend and everybody's excited for him. Right. So for us, we're looking forward to the day when we go back to victory lane and everybody's going to be fans of us again. Right. This year, you know, you, after Daytona, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about the Atlanta race. And at the end of the race, there was an incident and I haven't heard anyone really talk about it, but where you were on pit road coming up, and something happened. I don't know if a towing broke or what, yeah. but you shot up the track almost in front of Blaney. Can you tell me what happened there? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it was, it was sketchy, honestly. So what, you know, obviously I put it around into the, into the pit stall and, and the guys assessed the damage to the car after the accident. Um, 
you know, it was, we knew the tow link was bent. Um, you know, I'm not sure to what it, you know, I wasn't exactly sure to what extent, but, you know, basically the guess, I guess I can, the best way I can explain it is the, the, the left rear toe link was bent significantly where the, the front of the tire was facing out. Okay. And the best thing that I can explain is cause it wasn't, you know, it, I think I laugh when I see stuff like that. Cause people think like, man, what's the guy doing? Like, I'm not, wasn't out there trying to do burnouts, right? Like I'm just <laughs> putting around on the apron and with, the, and we're going back to the garage at that point. Um, that was the instructions was to just drive the car around and go to the garage. And, um, the best thing I can, you know, I think they're just, you know, once the car got to a certain speed or maybe the banking affected, there's a little banking transition on the apron, but no, nonetheless, like it felt like it, it shifted a lot of weight and it completely jerked the wheel out of my hands. And, you know, thankfully it was, you know, the timing of it can be, could have been very bad, but you know, really it was, it looked worse, I guess, than, you know, there was still a couple car lengths gap, but, but yeah, it was, it was an uncomfortable situation, right? I mean, it's hard to, you know, the, with the transaxle and the, and the rear tires, the tow links and how they all work, right? Like if, if one gets knocked out of alignment, it can really throw off how that whole, the mechanics of that transaxle works. And uh, yeah, I think that it just, it caught me off guard and jerk kind of cut, cut all to the right at once. And like I said, thankfully I, it was all just a, you know, it was a close, close call, I guess, but yeah, I'm not sure, you know, aside from us getting towed back to the garage, I don't really know what I would have done different in that situation. Right. So let's come back to this past weekend in Las Vegas and you had your best finish of the year at 20th, but during the race, I was listening to your radio and apparently Mr. Keselowski flipped you off at some point and you were saying, Hey, he could have passed me. I was running low. He was running high. And then you used the choice word for him. And I thought it was interesting because you said at the very end of that exchange, I don't know them. So do you take that attitude this year because you are a rookie, you don't have relationships with all these guys besides SHR. And it kind of allows you to operate more freely where you're not worried about hurting anyone's feelings. Because we've heard Joey Logano and different people talk about on the racetrack, they don't care. They're not friends with anyone. So, I mean, that, that kind of seems like that was your mentality with what you had to say on Sunday? Well, I think, um, you know, for, for one, yeah, I think that that, that type of mentality, I think is, is a reasonable, reasonable to have in this day and age. Right. I mean, it is as competitive as the field is and how close everybody is, it's hard to give and give and take much, um, at, at that level. Right. And even, you know, even in your mid pack, like everybody's, um, you know, fighting, fighting for so much in different, different scenarios, but, um, yeah, it, it was an interesting exchange. It's kind of funny because, um, you know, TJ, TJ major spots for Brad and he spotted for me last year. So actually I talked to, talked to TJ for a while yesterday and just tried to understand, um, or, or kind of fill out exactly what the scenario was from their eyes. And, um, yeah, I took, took some stuff away from that. Right. Like I'm not, you know, obviously when we're, um, you know, you, you, you're learning, learning these guys, racing with them, you know, and, and I think building that relationship and it's just getting, it's like I said, I don't, I don't know Brad. Right. Um, but the, you know, obviously, obviously, you know, Brad was expecting me to, um, you know, maybe be a little bit more, you know, I mean, basically wanted me to more or less let him go. Right. Um, right. and, and I, I think, um, and, and the message that was relayed back to me is that, you know, one day, you know, they feel like that, you know, the role's going to be reversed and I'm going to get repaid the favor. So, you know, as far as me, like I, I race people, how, you know, I try to race people, how they race me. And, you know, that's an age old saying. And right. like I said, it was, uh, it all worked out. Last question. So you've had these exper this experience of working for Dell Jr., a hall of famer, Tony Stewart, a hall of famer, kind of, compare the two and talk about maybe their differences, but I mean, just looking at your career and how you've had this opportunity and I guess a blessing to work with these two well-regarded hall of famers in NASCAR. And now you've, you have, uh, have the opportunity to work with Tony. Just talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, no, it's been a great, great experience. And honestly, I think, um, you know, from, from my side and, and obviously as I still continue building a relationship with Tony, um, you know, the one thing that, I will say is that, you know, they both, um, 
you know, their resume speak for themselves, but just the culture and the the people that they put in place at, at each of the companies, I think is, you know, just really has been a really great experience to work with each one of them. Right. I think from the, the from the driving side, I think they're, you know, believe it or not, I feel like their, their approach and their, um, I guess, uh, pointers that they'd give you before the race, you're actually kind of similar, right? Like Tony, Tony and Dale are both, you know, they both were both always like, Hey man, just do your thing, be patient, be there at the end. That's the age old saying, right? So, and it's so important in these days, right? I mean, they know that, um, how long these cup races are and, and so much that can happen in them, um, that, you know, especially the first couple with the super speedway style racing, right? Like you just have to make it to the end and be there and be in position to, to have a good finish. So, um, you know, really, I think that for me, a lot of it has felt the same. Um, you know, they just have a core group of guys that, you know, a lot of them that, that have been around racing a long time that, that run each of the companies and, and it just makes it, uh, as a driver, just a really easy fit to, uh, to come, come here every day and, and get ready to go to work. That's great. Thanks, Josh. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me. I wish you the best of luck this coming weekend at Phoenix, and uh, I'll see you a couple weeks at Coda. Yep. Thank you, man. Thanks, bud. Take care.